right, good morning again. It's so good to see you here today. Uh, man, I had the opportunity to, make, to meet several visitors here today. Uh, visitors literally from around the world. I met someone from Africa here this morning and someone else from Canada here today. And so we're so glad that you have chosen to be with us. Let me go ahead and announce, and you'll hear it in the announcement video at the conclusion of the service, but this coming Saturday is the memorial service for our own missionary and friend, Mike Rittering. It'll take place here at one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, we're gonna need hundreds of our people involved in this. And so if you're involved in any of our ministries, parking, first impressions, our deacons, our elders, uh, we're going to ask you to arrive early. And quite frankly, if you want a seat, a good seat for this memorial service, I would encourage you to get here. Uh, the doors will open at noon. The service will start at one. And we're expecting literally several thousand people to be here on Saturday. So please be in prayer for us. Uh, for the Rittering family, Amy arrives this week. She's doing really well. And uh, we're anxious to be able to love on her and the family. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We can pull the house lights up, guys. Matthew chapter 5. Several weeks ago, we began a series of messages on the Sermon of the Mount that we have simply labeled, we've simply titled, Flipped. Uh, we, we labeled it that, we titled it that, because Jesus desires to take your life and mine and literally turn it upside down. Uh, he, he desires to, to, to flip our life, to completely turn it around. We're going one direction, and he desires for us to go the complete opposite direction. And so uh, I would ask you just a very personal question. You don't have to raise your hand, respond, yell out, or anything, but the question is this, is Jesus changing your life? Uh, I'm not talking about the fact that, that your life was changed 20 years ago or, or 30 years ago when you became a believer, but is Jesus actively, right now, at this moment, changing you and molding you to be like his son? Has Jesus, is Jesus flipping your life? Last week we saw one verse in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, and, and Jesus simply said this, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we saw that being poor in spirit means that we recognize our own sinfulness, our own depravity before God, and we recognize our dependence upon God, how very much we need Him. And I trust you've lived this week with an, with an understanding, a realization of that dependence that you cannot make it on your own. Today's verse, short as well, follows in sequence of what we learned last week. And so notice one simple verse today, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. Jesus simply says this, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Would you read that with me? I think it's up on the screen. Let's read that together today. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Would you pray with me today? Holy Spirit of God, we're asking you to take the word of God today and help us to, to hear the words of Jesus. Help us to understand the words of Jesus and help us to apply them to our life. Father, we, we confess that there's so many noises, so many voices that are crying out for our attention that often we fail to listen, we fail to hear. So I pray today that you would help us to hear, help us to listen, help us to respond to you. And Lord, I pray that we would be able to live out the truth of this verse and the other verses that we're going to study this week. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, quite frankly, the two phrases that we read in this verse do not seem to go uh, together. Um, they would be what our English teachers refer to as a paradox. We have any English teachers here with us today? I want to make sure that I get my... Okay, good. Don't we? I, I, I thought for... Good. Maybe there's none, so, so I don't have to worry about being... Uh, uh, maybe 100% correct, but uh, a paradox, you might think a paradox, what is that? It's not two doctors in the exact same room. Let me just rule that out, all right? All right? A paradox is this, and I've given it to you in your outline. A paradox is a statement 
that seems to contradict itself. But after further investigation, after further examination, it often proves to be true. Now, we use paradoxes in, in our conversation on a regular basis, and some of them prove to be true, and some of them don't. For example, sometime we would say, talking about a restaurant, ah, nobody goes to that restaurant, it's way too crowded. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, we would say something like that, nobody goes, but it's too crowded, don't go there. That, that, that's a paradox. Two statements that, that just don't jive, don't seem to fit together. Here's a, here's a, a paradox that would make sense, and it's true. The more you fail, the more likely you are to succeed. Now, 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 first we listen to that, that seemingly doesn't make sense. What do you mean? The more we fail, the more successful we're going to be? But that makes sense because we learn by failing. Take Albert Einstein. How many times did he try to invent the light bulb, and he failed, and he failed, and failed, until finally he became successful. And our lives have forever been changed. Someone who says this, the only certainty is that nothing is ever certain. It's a paradox. It's a phrase that, that might not seem to make sense, but, but the truth is there. The more you investigate, the more you study, you realize that it's a truth. Well, today's verse seems to contradict itself. Jesus says this, blessed are those who mourn. I would remind you that the word blessed in our text has the idea of happiness. It speaks of inner joy that is unaffected by the circumstances of life. And so in other words, Jesus is not just saying, blessed are those who mourn. We, kind of, we can grasp that. Here's what Jesus is saying. Happy are those who mourn. Uh, one translator has even said it this way. If you have a modern translation, one translator has said this, happy are the sad. <laughs> That seem, it doesn't seem to make any, you say, wait a second, Brian, what are you talking about? How can I be sad and happy at the exact same time? How can I demonstrate real inner joy and yet experience sadness? That's what Jesus is talking about in this verse. Jesus is saying that even during our times of mourning, even during our times of grief and sadness, you and I can truly be happy. We can demonstrate true joy. So today, I just asked three simple questions that I kind of want to try to answer from the text and from other texts today. The first question is this, what does it mean to mourn? When Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, what does that mean? Can we turn my mic down just a second, guys? To me, it seems just a little hot. Can we turn my microphone down, Danny, just a little bit? So when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, what exactly is Jesus talking about? Well, in our culture, the idea of mourning has the idea of grief. It has the idea of sadness. It speaks of lamenting. It speaks of bemoaning something that happens to us. For example, we mourn or we moan when our sports teams lose, do we not? Now listen, you might sit back and say, no, I don't. I know you do, because I know we have some devout Miami Dolphins fans in here, and every Sunday when the Dolphins lose, which is most Sundays, we what? We, we, we mourn. We, we express grief. We, we express sadness. We we mourn when our favorite television shows are canceled. How could they cancel that show? And, and we mourn, and we actually, there's a little bit of grief and lamenting that goes on. We, we lament when gas prices go up, do we not? I mean, gas prices go up, and all of a sudden, man, we are, we are lamenting. We are bemoaning that. Well, the type of grief that Jesus mentions in this verse is not that type of grief. As a matter of fact, there, there are nine different words. We know the New Testament was, wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, in Koine Greek. And there are nine different Greek words that are translated mourning, sorrow, or sadness in the New Testament. The word that Jesus uses here is the strongest and the most severe of them. 
So if you're following along in your outlines, the word mourn means to experience deep inner agony. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he's not just talking about a passing grief, something that we feel for a few moments and then a few moments later it's forgotten. No, Jesus is talking about deep inner agony. The word that is used here is often used in the Bible speaking of grieving the death of a loved one. Let me give you two biblical examples Genesis chapter 37 and verse 34 in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, talking about um, Jacob and Joseph. Remember the story of Jacob and Joseph? You you know, Jacob had 12 sons, and and Joseph, you know, his favorite son was sold into slavery. And when the brothers come back and they tell dad, they tell Jacob, hey, they made up this lie. They said, hey, Joseph is dead. Verse 34, in Genesis 37, Jacob's response, Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Exact same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 5, 4. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 10, speaking of, of the disciples mourning the death of Jesus, it simply says this in Matthew 16, 10, she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned, and wept. And so the word that Jesus uses is not a superficial word. It, it's a word that refers to deep inner agony. We understand that type of grieving, do we not? If you've lost a loved one, you know what it means to experience deep, profound grief. As a congregation, we've experienced that the last two weeks as we have mourned, correct term, we have mourned the death of our missionary, our church member, our friend, Mike Rittering. There there is no deeper pain than that of losing someone that you and I dearly love. Our great God offers comfort Our great God offers consolation during those difficult times. And I know there's people in our congregation that are are going through mourning the loss of a loved one at this moment. The neat thing about God is that he understands that because he lost the son who was so very precious to him. And he understands the grief that we go through. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comforts, who comforts us in all our affliction. If you're here today and you're grieving, if you're here today and you're, you're mourning, God is the one who offers you consolation. God is the one who offers you comfort. He is a God of comforts. And you and I can find our comforts and our consolation and our peace in him. As painful though as it is to lose a loved one, that's not what Jesus is referring to in this passage. When Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he's not talking about those who have lost a loved one. Obviously he feels for those people, but that's not what he's talking about in this passage. You say, Brian, how do we know that? Because we look at the context. In the previous verse, remember we studied it last week, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means that we understand our depraved condition. We understand that we are sinners in the sight of God. We understand that the very best that we can do, our best efforts, our righteousness in God's eyes, is just like filthy rags. We understand that it drives us to a dependence upon God. And on the heels of saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. What is he referring to then? Well, here in Matthew 5, 4, Jesus uses the word in reference to godly sorrow for our sin. That's in your notes. When Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, he is speaking of those who feel a deep inner agony. He is speaking of those who experience grief, who experience sadness because they have sinned against a holy, righteous God. You see, recognizing our sinfulness 
should cause us to mourn. Recognizing our sinfulness should cause us to grieve. Recognizing our sinfulness should cause us to be brokenhearted for our sin. Hey, hey, hey church, listen, listen today. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we view sin differently than God views sin. We have a tendency to view sin as a mistake. It was a blunder, all right? I blew it. I get it. No big deal. I'll do better next time. That's the way we view sin. And so in our minds, okay, I've sinned and I've blown it. I've been unfaithful to my wife. I've looked at things that I shouldn't. Man, my anger is explosive. Man, some curse words have flown out of my mouth that I shouldn't say. But you know what? No big deal. I'll, I'll correct it at some point. And we fail to realize that God views sin differently. To God, it's not just a mistake. To God, it's an offense. It's an offense against his holiness. It's an offense against his righteousness. Our response to sin should not be trivial. Our response to sin should not be petty. Our response to sin should not be frivolous. Think with me today, and, and, and these, are, these are things that I've worked through in my own life this week. And, and just as I share these with you, please know that, that God's kind of done a work on Brian this week. But, but we have a tendency to take the hands that God created for the purpose of serving him and serving others, and we use these hands in sinful ways, in ways for which they were not intended. We take the eyes that God has given to us for the purpose of looking on him. And we use those eyes to view sinful and disgusting things. We take our mouths that God has created for the purpose of praising him. Our tongues that he created for the purpose of praising him. And we use those things that God created for his praise, to curse and to swear and to belittle others. How can we minimize our sin? Such offenses should break our hearts. And yet, quite frankly, we become so desensitized to sin that we can sin repeatedly over and over and over, and it doesn't affect us. We don't grieve for our sin. We don't mourn over our sin. And as a result, if we're not careful, we repeat the same sins over and over and over. Can I ask you today, when was the last time that you were brokenhearted over your sin? You might sit back and say, well, hold on, Brian, my sins aren't that bad. It's not like I'm out robbing banks or being unfaithful to my wife. All right, my sins in comparison to other people's sins aren't that bad. We need to realize, as, as Joel read in the passage of Scripture there in Isaiah, that any sins, whether they're grievous sins in our vocabulary or whether they're innocent sins in our vocabulary, any sin grieves and offends God. When were the last time that I was broken over my sin? When was the last time that you were broken over your sin? Isaiah 66, 2 said, but this is the one to whom I will look, God says. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble, he who is contrite, in spirit, and he or she who trembles at my word. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he most certainly has a heart for those that have experienced the loss of a loved one. And he understands that better than any of us can. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. 
Jesus is talking about blessed. Happy are those who understand that their sin offends a holy and a righteous God. Jesus is talking about godly sorrow in the passage. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow for our sin. So let me ask you a a second question then. If Jesus is referring to godly sorrow, how can you and I experience godly sorrow? How can we see our sin as God sees our sin? Not the way everybody else sees our sin, but how can we see our sin just as God sees our sin? Let me remind you of a story in the Old Testament and read some verses. Remember King David? King David was was God's man. He, He was God's choice to be king of Israel. As a matter of fact, the Bible uses the terms, he was a man after God's own heart. A man who who sought after God. A man who who worshipped God. Why the Psalms that we have, the majority of them were written by David as he sat out underneath the stars and he praised God. It is good and as godly as David was, David made a huge mistake. David committed a horrific sin. David committed adultery with a lady by the name of Bathsheba who was married to a man named Uriah. And if that wasn't enough, David caused the death of Uriah, murdered Uriah. God's man sinning in an atrocious, horrible way. How would David respond to his sin? Psalm 51 is David's response to his sin. Would you follow along as we read that? Psalm 51 and verse one. David says, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Verse two. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions And my sin is ever before me. Pause for a second. Notice the different words that David uses for his sin. Iniquity, sin, transgressions. He's not covering this over. He's not acting as if it's not something that's important. He's recognizing the gravity of what he has done. That he's not only offended against Bathsheba and Uriah, but that he he has offended a holy and righteous God. So let me pause there for a second. How do you and I, How do we experience godly sorrow? The first thing I wrote in your notes is this. We must be sensitive sensitive to our sin. We must be sensitive to our sin. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we become desensitized in our culture. Have we not? Can, Can I step on some toes for just a minute? We become desensitized in our culture. Blatant fornication and adultery used to offend us. It no longer offends us. It's now the entertainment that we watch on television. Vulgar language and coarse humor used to bother us as believers, but now we're even known to let one fly every now and then. Sometimes we're not the ones laughing at the vulgar jokes. Sometimes we're the ones that are telling the vulgar jokes. What happens? We become desensitized to our sin. Here, listen. How can I experience godly sorrow in my life? I I must be so in tune with God that, that I realize the moment that I have sinned. And I realize that that moment that I have offended God. David says this in verse 3. He said, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In other words, he, he recognizes he can't forget it. He doesn't put it out of his mind. He doesn't act like it's not a big deal. In front of his eyes, in front of his heart all the time is the fact that he has sinned against God. 
You see, to be, ten- to be sensitive of your sin means that there's an awareness of your sin. There, there's an awareness of your sin that we didn't have before. We don't allow our sins to stack up, ignoring them as if they were no big deal. We're sensitive to them. Here's the second thing. The second thing is this. Realize that your sin grieves. That's such a a great word. Realize that your sin grieves a holy and a righteous God. We were in Psalm 51. Notice verse 4 of Psalm 51. Notice what David says in verse 4. David says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Who is David addressing his words to? He's addressing his words to God. Now, obviously, David sinned against Bathsheba. That's a no-brainer. He certainly sinned against Uriah. I mean, Uriah is dead now, and so David sins this sin against him. But David is saying, God, I want you to know that more than I sinned against Bathsheba, more than I sinned against Uriah, I have sinned against you. And my sin, God, has offended you. God, I have done evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. As I mentioned, even though David had realized that he sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, most importantly, the most important victim of his sin was God. He had sinned against a holy and a righteous God. Here's Paul's twist on it. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Paul says this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, as believers, God has graciously planted the Holy Spirit of God in your heart and in your mind. Let me pause for a second. You might might not understand that. Today, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you have been saved, if your sins have been forgiven, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, and God has given him to you. God has gifted him to you, and God has gifted him to me. And the Holy Spirit has several jobs, several functions. He teaches us all things. He's the great teacher, but here's one of his biggest jobs. He's the great convictor. And God has placed the Holy Spirit of God in our life for this purpose, that whenever I do something wrong, something that offends God, the Holy Spirit of God is right there tapping me on the shoulder. Hey, hey, Brian, Brian, what you did was wrong. What you did offended a holy and a righteous God. To grieve means deep emotional pain, severe sorrow. And so not only do you and I experience deep emotional pain, but God experiences it as well. And when does God experience that? He experiences it when you and I sin. All sin is painful to God. But sin in God's children breaks his hearts. And when God's children refuse to change the ways of the old life for the ways of the new life, when believers continue to act like unbelievers and believers continue to respond like unbelievers, guess what? The heart of God is broken. And God grieves. A holy God grieves. I've told this story before, simple, silly story. But, but there's times that, that I grieve Vicky. Husbands, you know what that's like. I've told this story before. We have our house, in, not a big house, but we have our house is kind of divided like a lot of houses in South Florida. We have the master bedroom and, and master bathroom on one side, and the other side of the house are two bedrooms and, and, and a bathroom. And, and now that we're basically, you know, basically we're empty nesters, of course we have Amber, Amber's with us, the two bedrooms and the bathroom don't get used very often. And so at one point, Vicki said, um, Brian, please don't use that bathroom over by the spare bedrooms so I don't have to clean it. Does that make sense? And so she'd say, Brian, you know what? Don't use it because as guys, we're a little bit messier than ladies, right? I get that. And so she would say, Brian, don't use it. If you don't use that bathroom, I don't have to clean it. I get it. 
And so, guess I'm a guy, you know. I didn't want to take the extra five steps to the back of the house. And so I just go to the bathroom that I'm not supposed to use, all right? And, and I would use it, and she would say, didn't I ask you not to use that bathroom? And like, you know, dummy me, oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot, you know? And so, but I mean, but I mean, one day, you know, I had made my short trip to the bathroom that I'm not supposed to use. And I'm coming out, and, and she asks me. She wasn't mad. She wasn't upset. She just said, what did you do? that knife right in my heart. <laughs> what did you do? And, and I, I was caught. I mean, I'm, I'm in a deer in the headlights. I'm caught. You know, I'm trying to think, what story could I use? I was cleaning the bathroom. That's what I was doing. I was, I was cleaning the bathroom. No, I said, I used the bathroom. And she just made this simple statement. Why would you do that if I asked you not to? I, I, I mean, it, it's true. It's true. I realized that my actions grieved her. I try my best to not use that bathroom. I still have every now and then, right? I still do every now and then, but, I, but, but I'm conscious of the fact that when I do that, I hurt my wife. Listen, to a certain degree, that's what happens when we sin. Oh, we slough it off it's just a lie. You know what I had to? At the moment, I had to get out of it. I, I had to lie. It's just what I had to do. God understands. Does he really? God's hurt at that moment. Oh, man, you know what? I just blew up. I knew I shouldn't have blown up, but, but hey, you know what? It's just my temper, and the guy deserved it anyways. I'm sure God understands. Does he? I'm sure there's times that God looks at you and, and me in a still, small voice. What would you just do? Why did you do that when I asked you not to? Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let me give you a third thing. i got to go quickly. The third thing that I would say is this. Learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. As I mentioned, the job, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. In order to respond to him, we have to what? We have to listen. We have to not just hear we have to listen. I talk about this all the time. Guys, your wife ever look at you and say, are you listening to me? And, and, and our response is, yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, and, and then she goes further. Well, repeat what I just said, you know. And I've gotten really good. I have actually been able, I've become ambidextrous with both ears. <laughs> By that, I mean that I can listen to Vicky with this ear and be listening to the ball game with this ear, all right? And so at times when she says, what did I just say? I'm able to repeat that back, even though I really wasn't listening, all right? We do the exact same thing with the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God hasn't stopped working. You might sit back and say, well, Brian, I haven't heard him talk lately. He has not stopped speaking to you. He has not stopped speaking to me. We what? We just fail to listen when he talks. He speaks to us in a still, small voice. He tells us that action, that attitude grieved me. But we fail to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who experience godly sorrow for their sin. Let me, the third thing, let me just mention quickly, what are the results of godly sorrow? 
So so whenever you and I understand that our sin offends a holy and righteous God and we respond to that, what are the results of that? Go with me in your Bibles. I want you to see this. If you have a hard Bible, turn to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. I want you to see these two verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. Notice what Paul is saying. Paul is adding in a real sense to what Jesus is teaching here. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Paul says this, for godly grief, Remember how we define mourning as what? Godly sorrow over sin. Godly grief. This is what Paul says. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Verse 11, let me read it quickly. Then we'll go back. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But also what eagerness to clear yourselves. What, ign- what, ind- what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. Now, notice, here's what Paul says. Godly sorrow A godly sorrow over our sin produces repentance in our life that leads to salvation. Let me just define that word repentance for a moment. The word repentance means a change of mind. It means a change of heart. And I believe we can also say it means a change of direction. And so all of a sudden I'm walking in one direction. My life is all about me. It's about satisfying me. And all of a sudden I realize there's a God in heaven who loves me so much that he sent his only son Jesus Christ for me. And as a result of that, I realize that I have poverty of spirit. I'm depraved. I'm a sinner. And I repent of my sins. That repentance doesn't just mean that I flippantly confess them. But it means that there is a change of mind. There is a change of heart. I used to be able to do those things and it was no big deal. But now I see those actions, those attitudes, those responses as God sees them. There is a change of mind, a change of heart. And there's a 180 degree turn. I, I repent. Godly grief. My sin. My grief over my sin causes me to repent. It causes me to change my mind, to change my heart, and to change my actions. Notice what Paul says, not my words, Paul's, which what? Which lead to salvation, is what Paul says. I make a really strong statement. I hope I don't offend anybody, but if I do, I don't apologize for it. All right? We live in a day of easy believism. We live in a day in which churches are saying, Just pray a prayer. Come down front, pray this prayer. Just get baptized. No real change has to happen in your life. Just just pray a prayer. Just believe in Jesus. You don't have to change. You can keep living the way you do. Just trust in Jesus. It does not matter. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's not what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5. Here's what Jesus is saying. I believe with all of my heart, Jesus is saying, if you have not repented of your sin and have not shown a willingness to turn from that sin, listen, it's not perfection. I still sin. I still blow it. But there's a, but there's a change of desire. There's a change of, of willingness in my life. I want God to change me. If you have not repented of your sin and you have not expressed at the very least a willingness to turn from your sins and turn to Jesus, you are not a believer. It doesn't matter how much you attend church. It doesn't matter how much you give. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. It's godly grief for my sin that leads to repentance or produces repentance, which in turn what? Leads to salvation. Hey, the words of Jesus are very clear. Jesus said, in that day, there's going to be many people who say, Lord, didn't we attend church on Sunday? Lord, Lord, didn't we we serve? Didn't we do this? And Jesus' own words says, I'm going to look at him and say, 
depart from me, for I never knew you. Listen, church, please don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about perfectionism. I'm not talking about the fact that we trust Christ and and we no longer sin. I'm, I'm a perfect example of the fact that that does not happen. But Jesus is saying, there must come a time that we mourn over our sins. There must come a time that we that we express grief and sorrow for our sins. That sorrow leads us to repentance, which in turn leads to salvation. Let me mention one last thing. Godly sorrow leads to guilt-free living. Godly sorrow leads to guilt-free living. If we can put uh, verse 11 back up again of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Can we put that back up again? So here's what Paul says. So see what earnestness this godly grief is produced in you. But also, what eagerness to clear yourself. So all of a sudden we realize that, that, that my sin offends a holy, righteous God, and, and I repent of my sin. What does it produce in me? It produces an earnestness, a desire to please God. It produces an eagerness to all of a sudden be right with God produces an indignation against sin. I now see sin not as the world sees sin, but I see sin as God sees sin. What fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. Thankfully, not the punishment that you and I have to pay because Jesus already paid the punishment for our sins. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Here's a couple other verses. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Paul says this, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful. Jesus is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, true godly sorrow leads us to repentance, which results in salvation which allows us to live guilt-free. doesn't mean that we sin as much as we want, but it means that we understand that Jesus paid the price of our sins. And as a believer, all of my sins, past, present, and future, are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as his child, I can go to him and confess my sin, realizing that my sins have been forgiven. Not because of what I do, but because of what Jesus has done for me. So go back with me to Matthew chapter five and verse four. Just take that last phrase, I'm done. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who mourn over their sins. What's the promise? For they will be comforted. You see, the comfort that God offers those who mourn is so great, is so profound, that it transforms deep sorrow into profound joy. Here's what Jesus is saying. True happiness begins with an agonizing realization that our sin offends a holy God. And it's a realization that I cannot pay for my sin. My sins condemn me. The only hope that I have, the only hope is Jesus Christ, who already paid the punishment, the penalty for my sins. It doesn't allow me to keep sinning. The Romans dealt with that in Romans chapter 6. Well, if if the grace of God is demonstrated every time I sin, wouldn't it make sense for me to keep sinning? Right, I sin, God's grace. I sin, God's grace. More I sin, more grace. I'm going to sin more, so I receive more God's grace. Paul says, no way, Jose. That's what he says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. How can those who have been redeemed from sin continue to live therein? So, so here's a challenge for us today. As we approach these elements, the Lord's table, in just a few moments. When was the last time that you were brokenhearted over your sin? When was the last time other than flippantly saying, and please, I don't mean to be critical, but flippantly saying, oh God, please forgive me of all of my sins. The last time that I realized, man, when I get mad at my wife, 
I grieve a holy God. Whenever I, I, I swear at that guy who cuts me off in traffic, I grieve a holy God. Whenever I look at something on the internet that I shouldn't look at, I grieve a holy God. Whenever I watch something on TV that does not honor God, I grieve a holy God. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for their sins. They shall be comforted. Have you experienced the comfort of God's forgiveness today? Has there been a time in your life when you have repented, you realize that your sin, your sinful life, your depravity has, has, has offended a holy God and in sincerity you fall in before God either figuratively or literally and said, God, I'm a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I repent of my sins. I need you. Help me to find the comfort. Help me to find the forgiveness that is only found in Jesus Christ. Thank you.